ना है ना पढ़ो यार
a very good morning to everybody in this plenary session madam plenary uh, i request everybody to mute your mic uh we invite in this plenary session dr om p juneja sir dr madhavi nikam dr kalyani uh, vallath t s chandramauli sir and uh, dr prakash uh, joshi uh, in this plenary session we are very thankful to all the plenary speakers uh to bless the occasion and be with us uh, in this third plenary talk here uh to give a brief introduction of all the plenary speakers uh, uh, the first speaker of today's session is dr uh, om p juneja sir sir uh, is a former professor of uh, ms university of baroda uh, he also has worked for the canadian uh, uh, literary study center for a long period of time sir has also worked as professor emeritus with an institute in gujarat uh, at a very old age also he is uh, hyperactive uh, he is an online uh, uh, yoga guru also now uh, uh, and uh, a very interesting personality to meet and talk with an old man who keeps on inspiring and motivating young people like us uh, dr ompi juneja sir you are warmly welcome in this session and i would request you to uh, hand over the session and express your views uh, in the given time sir juneja sir so you to unmute unmute your mic sir juneja sir you have to unmute your mic no your your voice is not audible sir you have to unmute your mic junaya sir you have to just tap on the microphone you tap on the screen uh, and then tap on the microphone if you uh, are on laptop you can uh, scroll down the cursor down so the window will pop up on the on the laptop if you are working then you just have to scroll down so you will see the mic uh, icon no 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 uh, your mic is not unmute uh, sorry to interrupt sir good morning sir hello sir telip sir sorry to interrupt ah uh, yes Thomas, sir uh, please yeah, do yeah. chat him sir please uh, do chat him to unmute his mic sir hi we we are telling him to unmute his mic yeah yes sir yes sir yes sir yeah yeah okay yeah. okay maybe he is just logged out we can move on to the another one in 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 oh, case he is can, coming can you not hear me now ah uh, yes we can sir sir yeah we can we can sir okay, welcome okay because yeah. because from computer i have come to the uh my phone which is okay okay, uh, okay me, sir no problem yeah. I, only thing is is it okay yeah it is okay sir yeah please continue well, sir uh, juneja sir yeah first of all thank you very much uh, uh dilip bhai for inviting me and you have rightly said i am a very old man well i am running into my 80th year and i have been retired for last 15 16 years 16 years almost now now i particularly congratulate you for three reasons number one that you have taken this excellent opportunity of reorganizing knowledge in the new paradigm because this particular disease which is spreading all over the world will actually change the paradigm it will change the it there will be a paradigm shift in terms of 
नॉलेज एक्विजिशन डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन एंड रिसर्च पर्टिकुलरली बिकॉज रिसर्च एज बिकम सो ईजी नाउ एज अ मैटर ऑफ फैक्ट आई टेल यू हाउ इट इज दैट्स वन रीजन एंड नंबर टू इज that you still respect the old people which is a rare quality not many people do it so for that also i am obliged and number 3 that you are you are connecting me with new researchers who are really interested in doing some great research in this age of google where research has become a really difficult proposal for the simple reason because, because whatever you think whatever you think you always find it is there already somebody has already said somewhere this thing so where do you find an original idea an idea which really to which you would like number 2 it has also made it easy research research has made very easy Uh, because there is a lot of lot of information available on the uh, on the web on the world wide web so for that also it is very important so i particularly thank you for three reasons number 1 your respect for old age number 2 to connect me with the researchers and now you see and number 3 of course for connecting the entire community of english teachers uh who are generally very slow they are very slow to change so uh english teachers to this new technology which is going to be the norm very soon now the topic of my ta- my talk is living with death or philosophical suicide what i am going to do is i am going to discuss chaucer's partner's tale which i am sure nobody has read uh, because this this was the first text that we used to do in ba you know i am talking of the year 1961 okay when i was doing my ba ba part 1 so the entire chaucer's all the uh, stories all the tales had to be read and so partner's tale is one of them that is one and the other is i am going to discuss with you is albert camus the plague but what i am going to do is actually i am going to analyze the discourse on death in these two very important texts and then come to a conclusion whether the discourse where is the is this is this discourse based where in the western tradition is this discourse based and then again the question is whether this is how much will this discourse help us in india or is there some other discourse which is available in the indian tradition so this is all that i am going to do my work has been made easy by a participant who talked about uh, about camu uh, and i am thankful to him i think chetan prajapati i i heard him fully he has done my job very he has made my job very very easy so part 1 of this talk will be concerned about the discourse on death in partner's tale which is the which is one of the canterbury tales you know there are 29 pilgrims who are going to canterbury and because it is a long long journey and very arduous journey on which they are going uh, they are coming from all over england from many many parts and they they have combined at a place and now they have to climb up so what they do is they decide to tell stories so that time is well uh, well taken care of so in that one of them is partner's tale and this tale particularly there is a character called death in this when i was researching on this issue what i found there is a lot of talk on other topics like for example uh there are other characters on which you know they talk the old man the ancient man 
and and you know average and all these topics are discussed but nobody talks about death nobody not a single research paper i found on the discussion of death in this uh in this search so the question was that why are they not discussing death because after all pandemic means death what death and death has to be has to be dealt with how do you deal with that that is the question that chaucer is trying to do so the root cause the that is the root cause of this pen, this paradigm shift in the question of the mystery of death that may come in the form of epidemic or a war that kills millions of people within a short span of time that has to be tackled chaucer reveals this mystery in pardon's tale within the well established post century christian theology while albert camus unveils this within the 20th century science cosmology while chaucer makes merry with his 80, with his 29 pilgrims on way to canterbury camus finds his world absurd meaningless he finds it absurd and meaningless and this is what he says i don't know whether this world has a meaning that transcends it but i know that i don't know that meaning and that is impossible for me just now to know it while chaucer's physician in another trail uh, is a plague profiteer dr view who gives many deaths during the plague questions its existence so in this paper i shall attempt to do this now first i'll take up chaucer's partner's tale okay so that is a character and i am reading part of it this story this, this is how partner begins the story he says it's the three rioters i have to tell who long before the morning service bell were sitting in a tavern for a drink and as they sat they heard the hand bell clink before a coffin going to the grave one of them called the little tavern knave and said go and find out that at once look spry whose corpse is in that coffin passing by and see you get the name correctly too sir said the boy no need i promise you two hours before you came here i was told he was a friend of yours in days of old and suddenly last night the man was slain upon his bench so he goes on telling that this man was a friend who has been killed by death and then they say these these are three rioters because they are drunk they are completely drunk and they are drunk before the service bell rings that is you know before early in the morning so they say okay tell me where is the death so there is ancient man who is there old man who is there this old man says okay i'll tell you where it is oh he is he is there right now you know just just behind this tree you go there and these people go try to find but on while trying to find what happens is that when you, when they are walking they find gold coins and as soon as they find gold coins they said yes oh we should take all these gold coins go and drink okay so what they do is there are three they tell the younger one you go inside the village and buy some wine and bread and now these two boys the elder boy they say okay as soon as this boy comes we'll murder him so that and divide the money into two of us good so the third boy when he goes to the village instead of buying wine and bread he buys buys poison and fills it in the in the in those bottles and after filling it in the bottle he brings it here as soon as he comes back he says hey give us give us the wine to drink so they give him the give give him those bottles they, they these two boys drink and they die but before death before they die they have discovered this game of the third boy so they fight with each other they kill each other the question is they don't reach death 
who is sitting still under the oak tree. So the question is that uh, now this, this question of death, as I told you, has not been interpreted by any critic in, uh, in my knowledge. So the question is, what, what have, they, what have they, they, this, they been talking about? They have been talking about that partner is a person who has a moral to teach and the moral to teach is, in Latin, it is redix memorum est cupidas. That is in English, it says, love of money is the root of all evil. So the story has been interpreted as love of money. It has nothing to do with death. The question is that why the question of death has not been discussed here in this tale? Why, why no critic takes it up? And my answer to that is because this was a very well settled 14th century world where God was well established. Everybody went to church. There was no question of asking a question. And therefore, in that very well settled world, death is not, not a question. It is accepted that death happens. It is natural. It is, uh, it is not because of any, uh, I mean, pandemic is also natural. Pandemic is supposed to be natural. Well, when God is unhappy, he punishes it. So that view is accepted. Now, when we come to Camus, the things change. I am not going to discuss the plot of the of the plague because most of you have read. And then I thank Dr. Chetan Prajapati who has discussed it in fair good details. And uh, now I come to the conclusion of this uh, book. The people of Iran therefore associate plague and something backward that belongs to another age. They think that plague is something backward. It doesn't concern them. Why? Because they are in the age of science. They are modern people with phones, trams, aeroplanes, and newspapers. They are surely not going to die like the wretches of 17th century London or 18th century Canton, and worse still, the pilgrims of Canterbury Tale. For them, death is a disease that is controllable by modern science through the process of what today people call as medicalization of death. Death can be delayed easily. With the help of a vaccine, you can postpone it. That is, the, that is what modern science tells us. And the characters in this, in this uh, uh, novel believe this, particularly Dr. Ryu, uh, who survives, and the other character who actually uh, delivers two sermons. Uh, he, is the, he is the churchman, but in both the sermons, he says this is, this is the will of the God, and uh, you know uh, we should accept it. But then he also dies, which means that God a plague. This is what he says. Anyway, I am I am I am coming to uh, last paragraph in with reference to this particular aspect. So there is a meaning in meaninglessness because Albert Camus propagated what is called as the idea of the absurd, which was some people interpreted as existentialism also. Of course, there are differences between, between uh, uh, Sartre and uh, uh, Camus on this idea. Anyway, is the, the, he says, there is no meaning in the midst. So is there a meaning in this meaningless of life as the word of Camus is absurd. This is what Camus says. In the midst of winter, I found there was within me an inevitable, an inevitable summer, and that makes me happy. For it says that no matter 
how hard the world pushes against me, within me there is something stronger, something better, pushing right back. Now he doesn't define what is that push, what is that is pushing him. Yes, he says, yes, my willpower can push me and I can do anything in the world. That is 19th, uh, 20th century and 19th century. Now, when we analyze this trajectory of two discourses about death, that is, the, that is hidden behind all the pandemics, we venture to summarize that there are two kinds of discourses, before and after Nietzsche's pronouncement about the Western, that is death of God. However, Albert Camus was possibly, was, uh, sees a possibility of life by accepting the idea of the absurd. It is a solution in which one accepts the absurd and continues to live in spite of it. Camus endorses his solution, believing that by accepting the absurd, one can believe the, great, the greatest extent of one's freedom by recognizing on religious, anyway, I leave that and uh, come to this uh, very important quotation, uh, sorry, by him. But then the question is that these two, these two discourses, one discourses of Chaucer, which is accepting the will of God. Death is just a natural phenomenon. And God want, when God wants to punish you, he sends you pandemics. The other is challenging this will of God and talking about another idea of existentialism or absurd or whatever you call it, because there are a lot of philosophy, a lot, lot of, lot of discourse on that. You know, like, uh, uh, like uh, uh, Camus is just one, but then Nietzsche, Heidegger, and, and a whole lot of people, Sartre. And you know, in my long life of teaching about, about Years, uh, just one minute. I'll, I'll take just two minutes. Abrahamic tradition has anthropocentric worldview that asserts God created mankind and in his own image. It further asserts, let them dominate. So this particular view, Abrahamic tradition view is, let us dominate the world. God created us, we are the, we have inherited it and therefore we can dominate the world. Now, the other, other worldview, uh, worldview that emerges from this is that the Western view has an eschatological view of history and destiny beginning with creation and ending with resurrection on judgment day. It is a linear movement. But then there are other traditions where the movement of life is circular, like the Aboriginal traditions and like many Eastern traditions, Hinduism, Buddhism, etc., etc. Now, in this kind of tradition, circular motion, life, is continuous. Life does not end with death. Life continues before life, before death and after death. Therefore, the idea of the absurd by Camus and the idea of the angst of Sartre in existentialism depends on the basic Christian uh, the, Abra uh, the Abrahamic tradition of thinking, which is, which has a linear view of life. And why it is so? The reason is because they take life, they take death only as a physical, psychological, and uh, casual or, you know, a rational view of life. Beyond that, they don't take. There is one more view of life, which I was reading, and I must point out, if you can see this book, here is the book, and this is Death, an Inside Story by Sadhguru Jaggi, whom you know very well. And what he says is that life has, sorry, death has a spiritual 
dimension. And what is that dimension? That is actually a spiritual process. And when you come to that, you find this process mentioned in Bhagavad Gita, where you believe, yes, you know, that there are many lives, etc., etc. But I am not concluding with that. I am concluding with uh, another very, very important source that is Patanjali Yoga Sutra. And uh, where what it says is, if we accept worldview that forms the bedrock of the discourses in the Bhagavad Gita, that is a, a in a pandemic does not take the dimensions of the absurd as seen by Camus or angst of Sartre in existentialism. Death is an existential reality and an opportunity, and I underline, an opportunity to raise the self to the level of superconsciousness, as Patanjali in Yoga Sutra says, Purusha becomes Purusha, Purush Vishesha. And I quote the final sutra of Patanjali Yoga Sutra, where he says, Purusharth Shunyanam Gunanam Pratipravaha Purushaha Kaivalyam. Swarup Pratishtha Va Chitta Shakti Purushaha Iti. What it means is that Kaivalya is the, is the restoration of Purusha to its natural form, which is pure consciousness. So what he is advising is that you are, you as a human being is nothing but consciousness. And we have this concept of uh, you know, uh, ahankar and, uh, you know, all that four, four things and chit, the consciousness of chit, which could is, which, which is translated into English as consciousness. So from this consciousness, if we are able to rise to super consciousness, then there is no death. And this presents another discourse Totally another discourse on pandemic. I'm not saying that, that we should not work, we should not you know, use the medical sciences to, to prolong ourselves, but then there are other means also where pandemic can be interpreted differently. Now my paper is finished, but just with one note. And the note is, when I started my career long, long ago, somewhere in 1970, 75, okay, so, sorry, 73. We started, we read English literature, particularly I read English literature under people who were trained in England in Oxford. And the, what they, they taught us was that there is nothing better than English literature in the world. When I came to teach myself in the Uni Baroda University, I found, I mean, when I worked for a PhD, I worked on anti-colonialism and the, uh, on uh, novels from uh, uh, Africa, India, put them together and tried to analyze a kind of anti-colonial discourse. But the book became very, very popular. Uh, it was sold very well. I got invitations from as many as 20 countries to go and talk about them. But then the problem that I now realize is after, after all this work, that I was working within the colonial discourse. My book, if anybody wants to take it, I have a you know e-copy. It is within the colonial discourse. Because all knowledge, Western knowledge, is within that discourse only. So when we are reading all these texts, I think we should be cautious. We should think of another discourses also which are available in the world. And I'm not saying only India. I'm saying Eastern traditions, Aboriginal traditions, where life is cyclical. Life is not just one straight line as the entire Western tradition, entire, you know, whether it is whether it is Satra or, or uh, Chaucer or Camus, they are all, they all fall in the same line because life begins at a particular point, it ends in grave, after which you have to wait 
till the day of resurrection but the other view is cyclical view and that cyclical view tells you that life goes on yes there was light before life there is there will be light after life thank you very very much for listening to me uh, thanks a lot sir it was very interesting uh, quite a new perspective you have given from an indian spiritual perspective you have tried to look at plague epidemics and the concept of death in that context thanks a lot sir for coming on this platform and sharing your views here uh before we move on to another one let me ask if all the plenary speakers are in the uh in the room or not uh, madhvi nikam uh, are you there yes sir uh, okay fine i will i will invite you uh, to speak sir. yeah uh, be ready for your uh, speech uh, sure. then dr kalyani vallath are you there dr kalyani vallath are you in the room dr kalyani uh, okay uh, dr t t s chandramauli sir dr chandramauli sir are you there uh, dr prakash joshi i'm very much here sir i'm here yeah fine sir sir, yeah, sir. okay yeah, good sir. Uh, i'm seeing now that, okay dr yes. kalyani also is there yeah sir yeah welcome uh, welcome all of you Uh, we are just waiting for T.S. Chandramouli. Maybe he will join uh, subsequently uh, here. Uh, before I invite uh, uh, Dr. Madhvi Nikam for the speech, I would like to make one request to all the attendees that if your mobile is shaking, if your camera is shaking, then put off your camera also along with your mic. Uh, if you are talking with uh, another person on phone or you are eating or you are moving on or somebody is uh, moving behind you, then also put your camera off so that this is the live footage going on youtube and facebook and uh, it will obviously not be a good footage if you will uh, do something else than listening and your camera is on dr jivan kumar you were on a long call uh, so when if there is an urgent call or other thing then put off your camera also on your mobile phone uh, karan parmar also was moving a lot is somewhere out in the farm i think Uh, if uh, your your camera is moving a lot then just put it off uh, uh, otherwise there is not any any problem uh, so second speaker of this session dr uh, madhvi oh. nikam from rkt college ulasnagar mumbai uh, university uh, 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 you are invited here to speak uh, uh, i think there is a problem madhvi nikam just left uh, okay she is again back yeah yeah please uh, madhvi ji you unmute your mic You have to unmute your mic. We are not listening. You, ah, yes. Now yeah, it is yeah. there. Yeah, please, Hello. please, ah, uh, madam. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, yeah. So can you just give me one minute? I'll just share my PPT. Uh, yeah, please take your time. Take your time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I just need one second. I can't help you. Mm -hmm. r r Hello. Hi. Yes. Yeah. Madam. Yes. I think there is some problem. I am not able to share my PPT. Uh, is it a, a laptop or a power uh, mobile phone? It's, a, it's in the mobile phone. I am clicking on share. I am going to my drive. It is saved in my drive. Ah, uh, share on this. Uh, if you share, what is the feature coming? Uh, just a minute. Uh, No, when if I go in drive. Take, if you want to take some time, we can take another speaker and then you can no, join no, us. No, no, I yeah. can just uh, do without PPT also. But uh, uh, okay, shall that, I share? Uh, okay, shall okay. I share it to you and you can uh, upload it? Ah, uh, uh, okay. Then I think it will take time. No, then uh, it's okay. Okay, I I'll go without PPT. I I don't have uh, issues. Okay, okay, fine. So you can keep your camera on. So, ah, uh, okay, fine. You can you can uh, talk orally. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Fine, fine. Actually, Please. I worked worked a lot on it, so I just wanted to show. But then somehow, it's not getting hooked. Okay, uh, shall I start? Yeah, yeah. Please start, madam. Yeah. Uh, good morning, all of you, and let me at the outset uh, 
thank Professor Dilip Barad for giving me this opportunity, and thanks to all the dignitaries and authorities of MK Bhavnagar University, uh, the Vice Chancellor and other patrons. Uh, today, uh, friends, I'm going to speak on film adaptation. As we know, uh, films are related. Can you hear me? Yeah, films are related to themes of disease, infection, and contagion fall into one of the three broad categories connected to fantasy, science fiction, or horror. Now, the apocalyptic destruction or uh, near destruction of the whole of humanity, rising concerns over bioterrorism, and the rise of an undead or form of zombie existence we have seen throughout the literature and through films as well. When we uh, uh, when I uh, decided to work on this topic on film adaptation, what came to my mind is like, why not discuss on issues which we have already known and heard about so many times, even seen, but were least concerned about it? Why did we come to this place at this moment? Because we are going through it now. Now, not going into what is a pandemic and what is an epidemic, I will straight away move to adaptation. Just in one minute, I'll explain to uh, the research scholars sitting across. Uh, adaptation, when we think about the first thing that comes to the mind of the researchers and even the teachers most of the time is adaptation is only from a novel. Is it so? No, it's not that. A film adaptation is actually a transfer of work or a story. But in this transfer of work or a story, it may be uh, from a, a science fiction, it may be from children's fiction, it may be from a film, it may be from a short story or even a play. So let us not confine ourselves to adaptations only from novels. So moving ahead, uh, I'm going to uh, the film adaptations. The first and foremost thing I would like to mention here is uh, talking about uh, film adaptation and about the contemporary uh, disease that is prevalent at this moment and the psychology that holds at, it holds at the center and the connection between media and film. More than anything, I feel at this moment that we are more concerned about the fear, the panic, and the epidemic. But are we not concerned about humanity? Are we not supposed to think more about it? So we need to focus on the contemporary issues, and literature is one of the best means to do so. Now, when we talk of the apocalypse, and when we talk of such disasters, it is thought-provoking that are we not aware of all such things, that they are there into existence? We are, but we are never prepared for it. Now, coming to film adaptation, I would like to speak on, first and foremost, Richard uh, Matheson's 1954 novel, I Am a Legend. So this film, uh, this novel was adopted uh, four times with four different titles. And that is something which fascinated me to you know, move, watch the movie as well. Uh, the novel was uh, adopt, adapted in 1964 as The Last Man on Earth, in 1968 as The Living Dead, in 19... The Omega Man in 1971, and as I Am a Legion in 2007. So Richard Matheson's novel, 1940, uh, 1954 novel, I Am a Legion, inspired these four different adaptations. And uh, it is a novel which is more uh, talking about the uh, apocalyptic uh, horror novel and is more influential in the modern development of a zombie and vampire literature. And it has popularized this concept of a zombie and vampire literature throughout the world. Throughout the world. Uh, talking about a techno thriller, when I decided to work on uh, film adaptations for this presentation, I decided I'll take uh, films from every genre so that it will help us to understand this concept of adaptation in a better way. Now, talking about a techno thriller uh, like the Andromeda Strain, which came in 1971, based on the novel of uh, Michel Crichton's novel, uh, the film follows all the scientists investigating an infectious organism that fell to Earth from space. Now, this was something very amazing for me. This was something I felt I should talk to the audience and let them know about it because this is a techno thriller uh, novel uh, documenting the efforts of the team of scientists uh, who in investigated this outbreak of a uh, deadly uh, microorganism in New Mexico. Now, microorganisms cause, as we all know, diseases like TB, cholera, and anthrax. So film is, this, this film, The Andromeda Strain, is not only a techno thriller, but it also comprises of elements which hamper the social and day-to-day -day life as well. Uh, now, the next uh, film adaptation I would like to speak about uh, is the George uh, Romero's Zombie Trilogy. 
Now the zombie trilogy, uh, like after the techno thriller, I've come to, come to this trilogy. Now film adaptation has been a part and parcel of the literary world from times immemorial. Down, uh, Dawn of the Dead uh, is taken from George uh, A. Rima, uh, Romero's uh, 1978 classic. And it just isn't a clever satire on consumerism. Now what is going to happen? We are passing through a phase which is really very difficult for all of us. This pandemic is going to affect and impact each and every nooks and corner of the world and everything that is under the sun. And consumerism is another factor which we all are experiencing is changing to a greater extent. With this online shopping, with the markets around and the uh, hype uh, in the rates that we are buying things at. So it, uh, this, this uh, movie adaptation um, looks like it, it also looks at how the zombie apocalypse, uh, apocalypse functions like a plague. It shows the global pandemics as a crisis which is really very difficult to solve. Now, this trilogy uh, consists of Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, and Day of the Dead. And such film, films, which are grimly very innovative, studies in the horrors that have shocked and entertained millions of viewers till now. Um, the next movie uh, I felt we should uh, discuss is The Outbreak. Outbreak is a 1995 uh, American medical disaster. Now, not only the genres, the uh, the incidents that happen, the diseases that spread, also I have chosen, I've, I've been very selective about it so that we know more about all these things that happened in the past. But though they have happened in the past, have we really learned something from them? That's the biggest question I felt when I was preparing for this lecture. So Outbreak is a 1995 American medical disaster film. Uh, it, it was uh, directed by the most world popular uh, uh, director, Wolfgang Peterson, and based on Richardson, uh, Richard uh, uh, Preston's non-fiction book. It is a non. It is adapted from a non-fiction book, and the name of the book is *The Hot Zone*. So, *Outbreak*, which was published in 1995, uh, it is about a viral disease that breaks out in a small American town, and how the scientists race against time to stop it from spreading. Unfortunately, they also have to deal with a bloodthirsty army general who wants the virus for a bioweapon. Now this bioweapon and uh, microorganisms or such bacteria or such viruses which are developed into labs, though we have a treaty for it and now nobody develops it, that is what we feel. But this is another concern which is raised through the movie and through the book as well. Now, uh, talking about, uh, though, though it is very, uh, the plot is very absurd, it is inspired by uh, the nonfiction uh, history of viruses like Ebola. Uh, uh, sometime back we thought, uh, like uh, uh, the viruses like Ebola or maybe the flu or we have cholera, Spanish flu, the avian uh, that, that is H1N1, then the Hong Kong flu that happened in 1968, 1969. Uh, we, we feel it, it is something that is not going to happen to us. But we are not an exception. And we have to be ready for such things and maybe for the consequences as well. And that is what we are facing at this moment. Talking about film adaptation, talking about... Uh, the liberty that the directors take at time, talking about how, how uh, there are different types of adaptations where you have a literal adaptation or sometimes the adaptation is faithful, sometimes the adaptation is loose and sometimes, sometimes it is not up to the mark. And when it is not up to the mark, it doesn't give uh, uh, the real worth or, or does not really transform what is there in the uh, novel, original novel. So uh, talking about uh, a very uh, famous, uh, another very famous film which has uh, been uh, taken from a film, a short film. Now, adaptation, you don't have to restrict or confine yourself just to a novel, as I have already earlier mentioned. So, here I have taken an example of 12 Monkeys. Now, 12 Monkeys is a 1995 uh, American science fiction film uh, directed by uh, Terry Gilliam, inspired by Chris Marker's 1962 short film. Now, this short film, La Jetty, is an adaptation which was converted into 12 Monkeys. It is a wonderful adaptation of this short film. Now, adaptation from a short film and making it uh, on a, or bringing it on a larger screen is also a skill of, uh, is the skill of the director. Now, Twelve Monkeys, uh, Terry uh, Gilliam's uh, science fiction uh, classic, uh, is, 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 it portrays the world just before and after uh, the end of the civilization when it was horroring after the pandemic that nearly wiped off, uh, out humanity. Now, a deadly virus, which was released in 1996 and had wiped 
millions of people uh, this adaptation is more fascinating because there is a group of army that we have been shown in the movie there are 12 such monkeys who are believed to have released released the virus now virus uh, that, that are there in the some are airborne some are born uh, and spread through the animals now talking about uh, film adaptations and viruses and pandemics and fevers we all are so much uh, concerned of the psychological impact of all this on the present scenario as we know at this moment hollywood may it be hollywood may it be bollywood everything is shut down and we are still trying to cope up with the fact that this is a reality and it is happening to us it happened on the on the screen we have seen it on the screen but we were least bothered and least concerned about it nature is playing its own role so when we are trying to bridge the gap gap between a novel and an on screen adaptation we try to understand what the reality in reality is between the reality is between the black and white and the colorful screen and there in between we lie in the deep valley and able to sort out any solution to it at this moment another uh, film i would like to speak about is cabin fever so cabin fever uh, is a two, uh, 2011 best selling and award winning uh, chi- children's book now so i have been uh, uh, experimenting with this adaptation genres where i have uh, also just now spoken about the techno thriller or i have spoken about uh, how adaptations can be done from a film a short film as well uh, from comics now there is another example i would like to uh, talk about is from uh, uh, the children's book now cabin uh, fever is a two th- 2011 best selling and award winning children's book and the sixth book in the diary of wimpy kids series written by an american author jeff kinney Now Jeff Kinney, when he wrote this uh, uh, children's uh, book or children's uh, series, uh, uh, he might not have uh, really felt that it could have been it could be uh, adopted uh, after years, but it was. Now, Cabin Fever uh, is actually Ellie Roth's director uh, directorial uh, debut, uh, which follows a group of recent college uh, graduates who come who become infected and infected with a very very horrible uh, disease like flesh eating virus. during a, a camp where where they go during a camp camping trip you may call it so it was remade in 2016 but the version uh, that we have and when we see it as audience it does not really appeal because when the, the director takes some cinematic liberties sometimes the real, the the real content or the real seriousness of the novel may be lost i'm not saying it is always lost it may be lost so film adaptations uh, though it sounds to be uh, very uh, good and very interesting at times if it is not worked upon properly it may not become uh, the mark of the day the next uh, film i would like to speak about is resident evil uh, now uh, resident evil uh, again is a series from uh, you must have uh, heard about it uh, action horror film written and directed by paul uh, ws anderson now borrowing elements from the video games he has borrowed all these elements of resident evil Uh, part one and part two, Resident Evil part one and part Evil part two uh, has taken. He has taken up this uh, elements or this idea uh, and adopted it into a, a series and uh, films film uh, uh, from a video game. Now in this video game also you can see uh, the evil uh, cooperation. Uh, there is a evil cooperation uh, corporation that creates a virus and that virus turns out most uh, uh, turns out most of the human beings or the humanity into zombies. now the as i earlier said the zombie and the uh, the vampire uh, literature through films we have seen plenty of it and we know that this is something that we are at present living uh, yesterday uh, one of the plenary speakers made uh, made a fleeting reference of 28 days later uh, and i would just like to mention uh, that film as well because 28 days later or 28 weeks later as well so 28 days later came in 2003 and 28 weeks later came in 2007 uh, and this was a film uh, uh, which actually uh, had uh, you know uh, a, uh, it was a sequel and directed by john carlos uh, the world uh, is shown uh, the movie sh- the movie portrays the viral pandemic that turns everyone that is infected into permanently enraged monsters human beings turn into monsters so when this film was released and uh, through the ppt you could have seen some of the pictures i had uploaded but unfortunately i could not connect it now this is the film in the latest film uh, you you find a massive epidemic has swept the world leaving in its wake a host uh, of rabid human human beings 
uh, who fe- who are uh, all full of hatred and uh, are bent on destroying everything that they touch god forbid we should be mentally prepared for all such things that may happen in the near future now uh, going uh, uh, to the next and the most interesting uh, uh, is uh, another adaptation uh, of uh, adaptation uh, that is a, a portuguese novel uh, by jose uh, saramago now jose saramago's uh, novel uh, was adapted blindness and it was it is based on uh, the uh, the entire idea uh, in the film and in the novel is about what happens when the entire world is hit by a pandemic that renders people blind you can just imagine the colorful world all of a sudden becomes black everything that is in front of your eyes is vanished and you cannot see anything as spectators or as audience or as maybe researchers teachers uh, from the teaching fraternity we would think or we would believe that this could just be an imagination but it is beyond imagination something of this sort like the uh, the uh, corona virus we are all are facing at the moment this uh, is a fact history also tells us history also tells us that every 100 year such a pandemic is there and there are such news cuttings which i had uploaded on my uh, uh, like ppt uh, maybe i would share it later but uh, now uh, this, there is a pandemic that renders people blind and what it for the uh, ca- like uh, it, it was the the uh, cast that is there in the film has entirely uh, given a su- such a wonderful uh, you may say uh, uh, best best of their uh, acting through uh, such uh, such a film where you really feel panic at the end of it that such thing if it happens in reality what will happen you will not be able to see your near and dear ones not be able to touch feel them beyond uh, one particular limit now talking of uh, another uh, film adaptation uh, that is black death uh, uh, all of you must have heard uh, it was it is it's a film based on the 40th century plague and uh, then you have spanish flu now spanish flu is uh, the forgotten fallen uh, in is in uh, was published uh, and uh, it came on the tv screen on 2009 in 2009 and it deals with the 1918 flu pandemic in manchester now it is a screenplay uh, which was written by uh, peter hanes now just see a screenplay also can be adapted now the spanish flu pandemic of 1918 uh, it is one of the deadliest in the history infected an estimated 500 million people can you believe estimated i'm just estimating 500 million uh, million people who were infected and about one third of the planet's population was killed to be estimated during such a pandemic now it is horrifying even to believe it is horrifying even to think that such a pandemic when it is portrayed on the uh, or it is screened uh, through the media you feel uh, you feel really very uh, shocked and devastated that such incidents may happen happen to us in uh, in future because we were never prepared for uh, what has what is there in existence at this moment uh, moving to uh, one of i i let's move I'll, uh, i'll just continue Uh, so uh, rise of the planet of the apes uh, again uh, is a wonderful uh, movie which you all must watch because the the, the reboot of the 1960s and 70s uh, and the planets of the apes uh, series this is a series which was anchored and it is truly exceptional uh, uh, you know uh, performance uh, you can see of the character the actors and wonderfully uh, portrayed because it is a uh, Uh, brain uh, it shows the brain power of an experimental viral based alzheimer treatment which unfortunately uh, mutates into a deadly pathogen that kills billions of human beings through film adaptations through the uh, world of films and movies we can really feel and we become sensitized to what what is happening around uh, now this is very fascinating because uh, now uh, since we are uh, locked down all of us are watching netflix prime and uh, we are into television a lot uh, contagion most of us must have seen uh, contagion which uh, which was actually now just imagine a movie which was published uh, which was uh, sorry which was, uh, came into existence in 2011 which came on screen in 2011 nine years after it we are so much uh, interested in watching it why so it has stopped the IB, uh, ibms uh, screen uh, the ladder as well now it has it has become very very popular every person now uh, m- like majority of them must have seen this movie contagion so the question is why after 9 years are we watching it 
why didn't we see it earlier why why are we uh, you know uh, the, the currently it is more, the currently second popular uh, movie uh, of the itunes in the us or maybe on the netflix about which much has been written in the uh, last one or two months nine years after its release the film offers a parallel to the current times it is a parallel to the present time to the current times tracing a disease outbreak attempts by the health officials to contain it by uh, by the uh, government by the medical officers by the police and the subsequent loss of normal social order this is something that we all are facing today and this is what is shown in the movie and that is why the movie appeals to us the movie which was shot in 2011 is now is has now fascinated millions of viewers why because it has turned into reality Now talking uh, uh, similarly, similarly about uh, there are there are many uh, movies which you can actually uh, watch or you can uh, have a look at and uh, I, I think I have two more minutes. I just uh, would like to uh, talk about the other literature that uh, falls uh, in the epidemic uh, 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 the category of what we were discussing till now. Now you, you, all of y'all uh, uh, can just read uh, Cherry, a novel Cherry by Nico Walker. Uh, there is another uh, by Barry Meir, Painkiller. The name of the novel is Painkiller, which is also adopted uh, into a movie. Then uh, you have uh, Superbugs, a novel again on epidemics. You have uh, uh, another very very uh, interesting one, and that is Albert Camus, uh, a novel by Albert Camus, The Plague. I hope all of you all have gone through this. The last one by Alexandra Olivia. You have. then you have station 11 by john mandel by emily john uh, emily john mandel then uh, you have the year of the flood by Ma margaret atwood uh, a lot can be said a lot of literature is already available on a pandemic an epidemic now uh, not not taking much time and not uh, keeping the other speakers waiting i would just like to conclude i would just like to conclude that the outbreak related movies uh, now has seen a surge on the imds uh, in uh, screen and the latter and many movies like the south korean movie flu or uh, the spanish flu outbreak contagion they have topped the ladder and have become more more popular these days because we are a part and parcel of it now uh i think i i should thank uh, i'm i'm concluding here that film adaptation is a medium to understand what is there in books sometimes it's not possible for us to uh, go through each and every word of a text but definitely through this uh, visuals that we have across on the television screen or maybe on the uh, larger screens will help us understand literature in a better way and film adaptations uh, as i said uh, talking about the recreation and reinterpretation or the transposition and intertextuality and alteration or maybe converting or pre uh, existing literary text into a film all these things uh, matters when we talk about adaptations uh, of of maybe novels or children's fiction or uh, the science fiction uh, not standing between the next speaker uh, i would like to thank uh, professor dilip barer for giving me uh, this opportunity to be with all of you all uh, so thank you for this marathon uh, event that you have organized connecting us to people in such a lockdown period thank you so much thanks a lot dr madhavi nikam it was very very informative a uh, very interesting bibliographic record of so many films and literary works that you have given which i think many uh, new research scholars will be benefit uh, if they want to do research in literature and epidemics uh, here uh, many uh, participants are asking for the ppt uh, powerpoint so presentation yeah if uh, many have commented about that so if uh, this is a request to all the plenary speakers if you want to share your powerpoint presentations with uh, everybody then you just uh, mail me i will upload on the website uh, the website that we have prepared for this webinar all the powerpoint presentations that we receive from all the plenary speakers will be made available uh, on that that website there thank you dr madhavi nikam thanks thank a lot yeah. uh, now i would like to invite dr kalyani wallath uh dr kalyani wallath is joining us from trivandrum kerala she is running an institute uh, there tes uh, institute and uh, dr kalyani wallath is on our screen uh, dr kalyani wallath over to you thank you very much sir thank you very much for this opportunity to uh
talk at this wonderful webinar that you've organized. A lot of speakers have talked about the epidemics and the representations of it in literature and the arts. And uh, I'm going to talk about the post-COVID world and the expectations that we have of literature education in the post-COVID world. The paper is titled, Survival of the Fittest, Imagining Literature Education in the Post-COVID World. Obviously, this reminds us of Charles Darwin. And in this paper, I'm going to talk about how in the future, literature is going to blend in an exciting way with uh, technology and sciences. So I thought Darwin would be a good metaphor for my paper. It will indeed take a long time for us to fully understand the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on literature and education and on human life in general. But one thing is clear that this crisis has led to massive changes in lifestyle and perspectives already. Since this pandemic is prone to reappear several times until it may be finally wiped out, and since COVID-19 may very well be probably one of the uh, many bio crises that we may be having in the future, it can be legitimately believed that these changes signal a transition in human society in many ways. When it comes to society, literature, as well as education, it is evident that the internet is going to dominate the future in significant ways. The internet itself emerged in the 1960s and 70s as a response to the Cold War. Uh, and the potential of a nuclear disaster. The COVID-19 pandemic has awakened in us the very same fears of catastrophe and annihilation as the Cold War had once done. And it has renewed our concerns for safety and survival. Even as the growth of technology and the internet uh, may put our personal security, the traditional values of our societies, etc., at risk, it is also exciting to think about how these technological leaps will transform our worlds. So first, let me quickly look at uh, what I think would be the impact on literature and the arts. There has been two changes underway in the digital age that have acquired a new significance in this post-COVID world. One, literature has been breaking free from the printed text for the past many decades now. Literature has been breaking free from the printed text and imploding into the area of culture. So whenever we talk about literature now, we are talking about culture. It is inevitable. Secondly, the strict separation between the humanities and the sciences that was strictly and jealously guarded before has been erased. So now when we talk about literature and culture, we are also inevitably talking about technology. So it is inevitable that literature, uh, culture, and technology should blend. The post-COVID uh, world is certainly in for an increased digitization of literature and the arts. And the traditional forms of literature and the arts may demand an archival approach. They will become the archives. Traditional genres have been of late replaced by new styles of literature and uh, arts, like kinetic poetry, which is where on the uh, screen words are moving graphically and forming, combining to make new meanings. Graphic novels, that is something everybody is familiar with, cinematic digital narratives, new media performances, interactive drama, e-poetry festivals and e-literature festivals, to name a few. Literature and the arts have been exploring new ways of traversing the complex textual spaces and integrating it with non-textual materials. Such explorations take on an immense significance now. Uh, so how does it impact education and research? The digital revolution coupled with the COVID-19 pandemic has brought about fundamental changes in the nature of teaching and learning, as well as it has thrown open immense possibilities for easy and effective learning. Educators across the world have instinctively turned to online teaching through videos and live platforms like Zoom, uh, our Google Meet, Google Classroom, etc. There is a mind-boggling variety of online courses offered 
uh, in Pozera, Udemy, Stanford Online, etc., by individual teachers as well as by universities ranging from the online universities to Oxford and Harvard. It is a fact that the nature and objectives of online teaching and learning are not the same as those in the classroom. That means if you record a lecture that you would normally give in the classroom and upload it in an online platform, that does not necessarily make it effective online teaching. So in the post-COVID world, teachers and students have to be ready to face the challenge of effective online teaching and learning. The values of the age of printing were significantly different from those of the previous age that is of orality. Similarly, there has been profound changes in this digital age in the understanding of what it means to be human, uh, a change in what our priorities and interests are, a change in what makes language effective, and a change in the ultimate end of education. So we should acknowledge these changes and harness the uh, power shifts that are generated by these changes. Like most sectors of human life today, such as the entertainment sector or food sector or tourism, or even medicine and education, everything is going to be completely taken over by the experience industry and the experience economy. What is experience economy? First, we had the agrarian economy, then we had the industrial economy, then we had the service economies. Now we have the uh, experience economy and the experience industry is taking over every field. How will we escape from the tyranny of textbooks and exams of the mass education system and turn education into a transformative experience? Not only at the primary level, as we already do, but also at the tertiary level, at the advanced level of education? And how do we draw the line between experience as entertainment and experience as analysis and technique? The performances that we show uh, through, through online platforms should not end up as entertainment. The videos and the lectures and everything that we show should lead students to analysis and critique. How do we do that? Academics across the world, as well as in India, have been of late using the digital medium to give a digitally immersive experience through revolutionary concepts like the flipped classroom and blended learning using multimedia resources, uh, as well as 3D modeling and other forms of visualization. The actual teaching and learning spaces are getting smaller at this time and multidisciplinary super labs have been functioning in several big universities of the world. Since the first super lab was established in 2006 at London Metropolitan University. These changes certainly raise many questions and leave many unanswered. We are aware of that. Will virtual learning replace real time learning? Will it provide all round learning? And perhaps most importantly, who will pay for these expensive technological innovations? So that brings me to change. Change has always been the hallmark of human evolution. In our English departments at first, we read only the classics, that is the greatest works by the greatest authors. Then decanonization happened and what was regarded as unimportant writing was also uh, began, to be, began to be studied, such as popular fiction popular fiction and marginal literature began to be studied for its cultural and political relevance. With the spread of cultural studies, things changed again. And sports, movies, fashion, food, everything began to be analyzed. At this time, the boundaries of the literary works broke free from the four walls of the written and printed text. And the text began to be understood as a discourse that is interactive and many voiced, multiple, ever changing and dialectical. In this period, literature departments embraced interdisciplinarity to a large extent, and this led to a fundamental questioning of the established beliefs and practices within one discipline. It was in the early 2000s, with the explosive developments in communications technologies and the so-called digital revolution, that a new discipline emerged, a totally new discipline that is called digital humanities, which is what I'm going to talk about, where digital technologies intersect with the humanities in the most interesting ways. This approach has found a new relevance in the context of COVID-19 pandemic. And that has, this has probably dealt a knockout blow to uh, all the traditional approaches within education and literature studies. Today, students of literature have to break free from the tyranny of the printed text and move into the fluid dynamics of interdisciplinarity. 
It is from the field of humanities computing that digital humanities emerged. And uh, uh, that was in the 1940s and 50s. Digital humanities is a crossover discipline connecting the social sciences like history and philosophy, archaeology and anthropology, statistics, linguistics, literature and the arts, library and information science, media studies, design and whatnot. All these uh, interdisciplinary connections are there in uh, digital humanities. In the constantly growing and changing field of the edge, technology and science are no longer two separate disciplines. They are two sides of the same approach. Now, digital humanities is a two-way approach. You have on the one side of technology, on the other side, humanities. It is a systematic use of digital resources or technology within humanities. At the same time, it is the humanistic analysis of the application of the technology or the digital resources. Uh, for example, take the discipline of history. A DH approach to history involves developing new analytical approaches to history regarding the creation of materials, documentation of materials, preservation, curation, and so on, which are all suited to the digital age. Uh, two, this also involves developing digital tools for data mining, digital mapping, hypertextualization, information retrieval, visualization, and so on. These are all big words, but if you do a quick Google search, you will be able to understand that these are all very simple things uh, which are used, uh, which are done using technology. And it is transforming the study of the humanities these days. Being a student of uh, digital humanities involves much more than a digitization of existing documents and processes and requires you to develop a set of approaches to be engaged in an exciting and challenging combination of tasks such as creation, computation, curation, and analysis. Uh, graduates and postgraduates in DH may work with web designing, software programming, technical writing, game studies, etc. These are all familiar disciplines. And they can also embark on new age professions, which are totally new. We have not even heard about them, like data manager, data designer, digital curator, cultural designer, information architect, data scientist, and metadata analyst. These are the new age professions that you can embark on if you go into digital humanities. From the graduation level to the doctoral level and postdoctoral level, you can do work there. In the realm of literature, the contribution of electronic literature organization towards facilitating the writing, publishing, and reading of electronic literature has been tremendous. The, there are so many organizations. Electronic literature organization is one organization, worldwide organization, that is into the writing, publishing, and reading of electronic literature. Some of the significant digital humanities projects that have been later taken up after the e-literature came into being, uh, all taken up at Western universities, are the mapping of uh, Republic of Letters by Stanford Humanities Center. It is a collaborative interdisciplinary uh, humanities research project on the Renaissance period and the Enlightenment. Then there is the Women Writers Project, uh, of the Northeastern University in Boston, the Perseus Project of Tufts University, which is a, a resource collection of the classics, the Global Shakespeare and Performance Archive, the Rossetti Archive. I will share the PowerPoint presentation where you will get all these names. You should look up these names and read extra on them and find out what is happening in these areas. There might be opportunities for research assistance or for some sort of collaboration at individual or university level, or there might be possibilities to start your own projects in your own universities. So take this seriously and look it up. Other interesting projects include curating digital exhibitions and museums online exhibitions and museums on anything ranging from painting and music to food. Spatial history projects, uh, projects on related disciplines like medical humanities. Now in the context of COVID, it has become very relevant. Medical humanities is an area that we should all be researching on and writing papers on, organizing conferences on. 
the nature of language communication reading writing speaking uh, comprehension everything has changed because of the digital revolution and because of this transition signaled by uh, this covid pandemic so how do we survive in this world how, who is the fittest and how do we survive i'm concluding with uh, the concluding points we need a new set of skills that are compatible with the changing scenario of knowledge students and teachers should all be equipped with technological skills but that is not all we should internalize the fact that the objectives nature and scope of education and research have all undergone a tectonic shift till now we were lying back on our couches and watching tv we were consumers till now of knowledge and teaching and what mattered was what we were being taught but not anymore that has changed now what matters will be how we learn things teaching has kind of ended and a new age exciting age of self learning and collaboration has started probably we are no longer the couch potatoes watching tv but we are active players inside a video game from the heavy weight of academic deliberations and theories the shift is now towards application engagement and experience if you are confused what that means i will put it simply we have to take up topics and projects within the uh, domain of digital humanities that interest us engage with these topics creatively in multiple multimedia platforms read and write about them as we have always done in an academic manner but also engage with our subjects through videos blogs podcasts apps games webinars and what not and disseminate ideas critique these ideas in ways that are of profound relevance to uh, your community as well as humanity at large so it is a matter of great hope and happiness that passing an exam or writing a dissertation may no longer be the professed aim of education and it may no longer be enough that you know certain things but it might become necessary that you are there in that discipline that you make your presence felt in the discipline in a versatile manner bringing about a change in your own way so despite all the disasters that the pandemic has hit us i see that it has also probably brought us a better future for education thank you very much Uh, thanks a lot dr kalyani wala that was a very inspiring encouraging motivating and full of high spirit uh, entrepreneurship in literature is something what you are one of the best examples of uh, after this uh, wonderful uh, presentation by dr kalyani wala uh, we now invite uh, dr t sai chandramouli sir from hyderabad telangana to join us Dr. Chandra Mouli sir from Hyderabad is joining us. Yes, sir, you are there. And uh, Dr. Chandra Mouli sir is a senior faculty member. He is a chief editor of a Virtuoso Journal, and a very interesting articles and write-ups are being brought up by his journal Virtuoso, published from Hyderabad. Uh, Chandra Mouli sir, we we welcome you here on this platform. Uh, you are going to show a powerpoint presentation and a talk so please share your screen uh, with us sir thank you very much thank you very much sir good afternoon everyone uh thank you so much the professor dilip barat sir for the kind words told about me i thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to be a part of this wonderful program you have been conducting for the last two days now my presentation is titled literature and epidemics response can you please share your screen so we all can see that sir is it convenient to you to share the screen sure you can press present now and the top most option you can select ha ah, yes is we it okay are, uh, now getting your screen. yeah we are yeah yeah just run the presentation Right, sir. Yeah, please. Hello. 
Is it okay? Ha, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, can you make it full screen? Run the presentation. Control F. Control okay. F. Control. Okay. Okay. My presentation is titled the Literature and Epidemics Response in India. When a pandemic, a tsunami, an earthquake, yeah. or yes, a sir, sir, we are not seeing full screen. Can you run the presentation? Slideshow. Can you run the slideshow? Yeah. Slide yeah. If anybody is there, they can help you. They can. Sure. I can help him, sir. So please, sir. Uh, so this is Thomas. Please uh, go to the cursor at the top, sir. There you can uh, uh, show the slide show, sir. Uh, slide show. So you click that and then you use from the beginning the slide show, sir. Even if you press F five, it will play F five button. Yeah. The top line of the keyboard F five. Is it okay, sir? Uh, F five, F five, top line of the keyboard. F five, can you click? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, to keep the show running, uh, let me give a sort of introduction to my presentation. When a pandemic, a tsunami, an earthquake, or a flood ravages mankind, it divorces everyone, infants in the womb, men and women, the sick and healthy, all races of all religions and people, irrespective of their ideological and political. Denominations. It's blind in its fury and swallows everything in its path, relentless and implacable as it marches on. I would like to first focus attention on the novel Samskara, written by U. R. Anantamurthy in Kannada first, and then translated into English by A. K. Ramanujan. Samskara was first published in 1965 in Kannada and was translated into English by A. K. Ramanujan in the year 1976. You are Anantamurti, popularly is known as a great uh, intellectual, writer, and a man of accomplishments, great accomplishments. Udipi Raja Gopalacharya Anantamurti was born on December 21st in the year 1932. He is considered a pioneer in the Navya movement in Kannada literature. He has published 24 books, a recipient of Padma Bhushan Award and also Gyan Peet Award. He wrote in Kannada, English, Hindi and Marathi. And not many people know that he was a poet too. The novel Samskara was made into a film and it was released in the year 1970. Girish Karnad enacted the role of Pranisha Chari. Snehalata Reddy extended a rare aura to the character of Chandri. Uh, her husband and Telugu poet Patabiram Reddy, you find some scars. Uh, Patabiram Reddy was the producer and director, and the film has won gold medal for being adjudged as the best among the feature films. This is Girish Karnad who played the role of Ranesh Acharya, the protagonist in the novel, Samskara. This is a Snehalata Reddy, enacting the role of Chandri. She was an activist and she was uh, incarcerated during the emergency. She also wrote a present diary, noting down her day-to-day -day experiences, day-to-day -day feelings owing to her fail, failing health and also the kind of ill treatment she received in the jail during the incarceration. Soon after release, she, I mean, released, soon after, re, soon after uh, releasing, I mean, released from the jail, she departed from this world. In the novel, there is a, a clash between a person by name Narayanapa and uh, other Brahmins. Essentially, it is a, a Brahmin Agrahara, where people follow the dictates and also the orders given by Pranish Acharya, the well-read man and the man whom they all venerate. Whereas Naranapa, his neighbor, is an uh, irreverent, uh, rebellious Brahmin who leads a hedonistic lifestyle, who marks at the Brahmins and their rituals and their superstitions. 
The Gritas goes out of the village to a nearby town and returns. He takes him and then dies. Now there is a problem faced by the Brahmins in the, the Agraha. Uh, in spite of his, uh, uh, what should I say, unbrahminical way of life, he has not been outcast. He has not been declared an outcast by the community there. Pranesha Charya was hoping against hope thinking that one day or other Naranapa will change his uh, style of functioning and uh, come back to the Brahminical way of life. But Naranapa is a bit uh, adamant, stubborn, because he is convinced of his own uh, convictions. Uh, when Naranapa dies, his body has to be cremated by a Brahmin only, because, since he, because he remains a Brahmin as he has not been declared an outcast. These people approach Pranesh Acharya and then uh, request him to find a sol solution. He turns to holy books and then tries to find a way out. Absolutely, he's not able to come across any solution. He goes to the temple of Maruti, that is uh, Anjaneya or Hanumanji, and then prays there, uh, requesting the God to show him a ray of uh, light and then guidance and show a way out, but no guidance comes and nothing has been there for him as a sort of solution offered by the God. Then he returns home, in the darkness he meets Chandri and it so happens that they unite and he feels the bliss of a union between a man and woman for the first time after 15 years of his married life. Now, he has been respecting his wife, worshipping her and then treating her well, just as he does his cow. He believes that by sticking to the norms of a, a householder, by being faithful to his wife, by serving her since she is an invalid, bedridden lady, he may accrue punya, he may accrue merit in the next birth. So also he worships uh, every god. As the time rolls by, rats in the thousands die and lies strewn all over the streets, while vultures begin to hover menacingly over the house of Naranapa. As you know, Naranapa is the center of attention and attraction in this novel. Well, more people start dying, even Pranesha's wife leaves this world. And uh, rats are dying and they are piling up in the streets. The Brahmins are hungry because they can't cook food and eat while a body is there lying for cremation or awaiting somebody to cremate. Well, in the uh, Durva Sapura, all the Brahmins have depended on uh, conventional rituals and look to Pranishacharya for guidance. Whereas there is a rationalist by name Manjaya who takes a quick decision, quite pragmatic in approach. He goes to the municipal authorities and then request them to help uh, these people in cremating the body of Narayanapa and then it is done quietly in spite of the epidemic, I mean the village or the Agrahara being in the grip of epidemic of plague. Now let me move on to a novel in Tamil written by Samutiram. This novel is titled Palai Pura. It was uh, published in the year 1998. Palai was written by Samutiran in the Samutiram, sorry, Samutiram means a cuddle, that is an ocean or sea. Uh, Samutiram was published as a serial in the novel, in the Telugu Tamil daily, daily newspaper, the Dinamani. In the year 2001, English version of it appears that is titled A Doubt in the Desert. Uh, it was sponsored by the non-profit organizations of Chennai. Coming to Samudram, let me tell you that uh, he was uh, an employee of the government of Tamil Nadu and then he was uh, appointed as a public relations officer. He also worked for some time in the All India AIR. He was interested with the project as well as the responsibility of creating awareness as well as a uh, instilling a sense of confidence among the people in Tamil Nadu as regards the HIV positive cases 
and also the uh, looming uh, epidemic or uh, what should we say the threatening uh, epidemic of AIDS. Those were the days when not many were sure about the so you are cure to uh, AIDS. Well then, uh, there was an incident, a real life incident, which prompted uh, Samudram to choose theme for his novel Palai Pura. Palai means desert, Pura means dove. So aptly it is translated into English as a, a dove in desert. Well then, in Tamil Nadu, there was a lady by name Kausalya, a HIV positive she was herself. She was a homemaker and activist. She notices that a HIV positive case person was marrying a healthy and innocent young girl. She just prevents the marriage. And uh, this has prompted the author to weave uh, a plot and then come out with a beautiful novel called uh, Palaipura. In this novel, there are uh, certain important characters, namely Kalaiwani, Manoha, Dr. Chandra, Velu, Esther, Dr. Ashokan, Dr. Sumati. Coming to Kalaiwani, she is a pivot uh, as well as a protagonist in this novel. She is a college teacher, returns to her village to take up community service. She is a leader of Nehru Yuvakendra. She takes up campaign for adult literacy, particularly among women sections or women folk in the village. She is engaged to Manoha, a computer engineer who is infected with a HIV positive. Her brother Velu threatens Dr. Chandra, who handled the case of Manohar and told him that he is suffering from HIV positive. Uh, Velu threatens Dr. Chandra that he will abduct and uh, she should not come in the way of uh, marriage between Manoha and uh, Halaiwani. Uh, Manohar marries uh, this lady. Before uh, that, he visits a quack who says uh, he is a normal person. Emboldened by this statement of the quack, uh, Manohar marries Kalaiwani and infects her. Coming to Dr. Chandra, she informs Manohar about his zero status, advises him to postpone marriage till final diagnosis is confirmed. Now, in spite of this advice given by the good natured doctor, a kind doctor, Dr. Chandra, Manohar still goes ahead and marries Kalaiwani and then moves over to USA on a project, uh, project work, rather, uh, deputed by his company where he is employed. The moment he lands in New York, his entry has been banned because uh, he is uh, a confirmed case of uh, uh, HIV positive. Uh, the publicity through the media makes him overnight you know the people in the city know who has come and they simply ask him to go back as it's happening in some places in our country at this moment. Now, a trusty fallen man, Manohar returns to Chennai, loses the job and uh, slowly walks into the trap or rather he gets into the company of HIV positive people. He is drawn to Esther who is also like him. Both these people lead a, a carefree life uh, thinking that uh, anyway they are going to die. So why should they bother about any kind of scruples or norms of living a decent life? They become sex workers to earn money to buy drugs. Kalaiwani is betrayed as we all know. We all know she is infected. Hence she is ostracized by the villagers who still follow the age old norms of superstitions and uh, what should I say, beliefs uh, and irrational, unscientific conditions. With the support of uh, Dr. Chandra and Dr. Ashok, a specialist in treating HIV positive cases, and her own family members, she recovers. But uh, she is prudent enough to abort uh, her own child. She joins Dr. Sumati's clinic where HIV people are being treated. Dr. Sumati is a st uh, uh, stands at the other extreme of the spectrum. She is the most unscrupulous doctor cheats patients without any sort of compunction and uh, she is exposed by Kalaiwani who stops a marriage of a HIV positive patient with an innocent healthy young girl. Now media publicity tarnishes the image of Dr. Sumati 
her practice collapses and uh, she could not uh, raise her head and uh, walk with confidence in the society. Coming to Kalaiwani, let us say that uh, she has overnight uh, become a celebrity, or rather she acquires the celebrity status and vigorously campaigns across the length and breadth of Tamil Nadu against the pandemic of uh, AIDS. She gives her own example, how she was infected, how she has uh, recovered with the support of family and the doctors who are kind to her. And then she emphasizes the need to test a prospective groom before engagement takes place or before marriage is uh, perf performed. She overcomes her own personal suffering through service to community, a remarkable way to overcome personal uh, setbacks. Uh, she sets up a volunteer organization supported by Dr. Chandra and Dr. Ashokan. It is a company we keep that also matters. If we are in good company, kind people, helpful people are there always to help us in moments of need, in moments of grief, in moments of distress. Now, she offers a helping hand to Hester, who seeks her support at the end to reform herself and join the mainstream and also join her campaign against AIDS. And uh, the wonderful part of Kalaiwani is uh, she accepts and forgives her husband, Manoha, who returns her, encouraged by Esther. Now, at the end of this novel, you find the author, Samutiram, stating, Kalaiwani, I quote, Kalaiwani, standing on a high ground, extended her hand to Esther, who seized it. She, who seized her hand, came to high ground without dragging down the helper, unquote. This is a wonderful way of concluding the novel. This is a wonderful way of giving message, positive message, inspiring one, highly motivating one, but from a responsible, socially conscious writer. We should also remember that apart from his government job and their responsibilities, he was discharging as a person heading the campaign against AIDS, he was also a social activist. He also believed in social justice. So, and generally in India, we are all compared to crabs in a basket. When a crab moves one inch up, there are two crabs to pull it down, two inches down, or rather two inches to the lower portion. In such a situation, in such a sort of a scenario around, in such a sort of society, we need people who instill confidence. We need people who are great motivators. We need people who inspire others in spite of their own personal feelings or in spite of the, uh, what should I say, uh, mistakes committed by the people concerned. In this novel, ample information is included in relation to causes, treatment, and cure of HIV positive cases. Theoretically, if you give any kind of information in any quantum, people cannot accept it or digest it comfortably. But if it is communicated in the form of a narrative and like this, people lap it up, people relish it, people enjoy it, digest it, and follow the suggestions made there. A shift from disease to illness, healing process in the narratives help one to realize that living with the epidemic our disease is possible and it is the only way to survive. So there is no need to give up hope, there is no need to succumb, there is no need, there is no need to accept defeat. Man has to be confident, man has to be inspired to combat however mighty the adversary might be. Isolation due to AIDS needs support from the family first and the community and uh, uh, kind-hearted and well-qualified doctors are always there to help the needy. After covering Kannada Tamil scenarios, let me move to my own domain, that is uh, Telangana and uh, Telugu. Our Chief Minister, KCR, soon after lockdown was declared, made uh, a call or he gave a call to all the creative writers to come out with their works to instill confidence in the people first. 
and also to create awareness about the coronavirus and also not to lose hope. And he also said that they should, they have a social responsibility in making use of their creative talent to spread the message and see that the lockdown is maintained strictly, regulations are followed, and the norms laid down by the government are respected by the people. Accordingly, online uh, poetry meeting or uh, meetings of the poets have taken place. Here is a poem written by Dr. Enugu Narsimharedi. Dr. Enugu Narsimharedi is a special grade deputy collector in the government service of Telangana, but he is on deputation to Telangana Sahitya Academy. He is the secretary of Telangana Sahitya Academy. The Telugu title of this poem is Gunsu uh, Tegali. Literally, it means the chain should break. It has been translated into English with the title, Snap the Link. With your permission, I would like to go through the file. No folk tale narrates presence of shapeless splinters of power. No epic explicates through which power life exists, through which body, though human body is a sea. Lizards are known, dinosaurs also are known. A bird is known that life that flies like a bird too. Where is the link for a reaction to an action? Our response is related to deeds of an earlier day. Found the tethers in Yama's hands, dear. Two hemispheres, countries on the poles. Tropical terrain, this is the situation. Where it slithers silently, when it devours life, unknown frailty, known inability to come back. You are unable to lighter within confines of a room. It has already crossed the borders. Corona is lame only when one lens support it spreads. Corona is blind, it moves only if one shows path showering light. Corona is mute, despite your eloquence, it silently reminds you. It's an airborne flame on the move. All places it touches turn into ashes for a rebirth. Remember the question of birth and rebirth in the novel Sam Samskara? There it is a more related to philosophy, belief in the chain of birds, uh, in reincarnation, etc. But here the poet is very pragmatic and talking about it, what's happening today in the society. So it's an airborne flame on the move, all places it touches turn into ashes for a river. Whether the real worlds are hot and puffs are of me, it is unknown, cannot be immersed in water nor can be cut with clippers. Now every part of the globe became a battlefield with an invisible enemy. From where he strikes, from where he attacks, nobody knows. Hence all the people are on tentatives. Let me proceed with the point. If only one can stay sans movement, its link gets snapped suddenly. If only people refrain from handling its empire collapses. If all people wear garland of hygiene, it slips away silently. If only distancing is sustained by all the concerned, it moves far away and disappears. Just three options for all to stay at home, to stay in the hospital, or remain under a reef. This poem is translated by PhD. In conclusion, may I state that there is only one way. We must all band together to fight evil. Whether the evil is a scourge of pandemic, such as the novel coronavirus outbreak, or hatred we find around us, it can be effectively countered. Let us live to love and love to live. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Dilip Baraj, sir, and your university officials and staff also. Thank you very much for a wonderful program.
in which you have given me a chance to associate myself with. Thanks a lot, sir. Uh, Dr. Chandramoli, sir, that was very interesting. Uh, good that you translated that poem and shared with us. That's a very interesting poem that you have shared with us. So thanks a lot, sir, uh, Chandramoli, sir, uh, for uh, receiving our invitation and coming on this platform to share your ideas on this topic, literature and uh, endemic, sir. Okay. Uh, now we invite the last plenary speaker of this session, that is uh, Dr. Prakash Joshi. He is joining with us from Sagar, Madhya Pradesh. Dr. Prakash Joshi, sir. Dr. Prakash Joshi, sir, are you there? Dr. Prakash Joshi, sir, was working with Banasthali University, Rajasthan yes, earlier. Ah, yes, sir, you are there. Yeah. Uh, let me just yes, give yes, a sir, introduction. Yes, yeah, yeah, sir, just a minute. Uh, uh, he was working with Banasthali uh, University, Rajasthan, and now he is with uh, Sagar uh, Central University uh, in uh, Madhya Pradesh. So, Prakash Joshi, sir, you are warmly welcome here in this uh, plenary. And please uh, uh, have your uh, let us have your talk, sir. Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Badad, and uh, uh, hello, every listener, every participant of this webinar. Um, my talk, I've been listening to uh, the talks since morning in the session, and yesterday morning also, I tuned in, joined uh, the webinar, the morning session, the first plenary uh, session. Um, and all of them have been good, nice, uh, nicely researched, uh, surveys. The mine is a different kind of talk. Uh, I'm focusing on a single work of fiction. And this work of fiction has been, uh, you know, categorized in the category of post apocalyptic, post apocalyptic fiction. So um, I'll take up Jack London's discarded letter as a post apocalyptic and introspective narrative of hope. Uh, the original uh, text of this uh, presentation is very long, but I have cut it short for this particular uh, presentation today. As I, I'll start uh, somewhere, you know, uh, skipping one third of the talk. Uh, this is how I'll start. If we begin with the European Renaissance, which many historians of culture have called the age of the beginning of modernism in the West, and take a leap over Boccaccio's De Cameron in the 14th century and Jonathan Swift's journal in the 18th. Mary Shelley's early 19th century, The Last Man, is a work that demands attention because it clearly portrays an apocalypse brought on by the worldwide ravages of the plague. Taking another leap, this time over the remainder of the 19th century, the whole of the 20th, if you look at the two decades of the current century, we come across many fictional writings incorporating massive devastation by viral epidemics as their subject matter, starting from 1919 with Joe Sarah Mago's blindness and ending with Lawrence Wright's The End of October that came out in March 2020. We get a list of at least 10 works of fiction. Um, um, uh, incorporating viral epidemics in a big way in their thoughts. Among these 10 are included works of fiction by Nobel, Pulitzer, Booker Prize winners, in the sense that they portray a massive annihilation of human population by epidemics. Quite a few of these 10 would pass for inclusion in the category of what has been identified as post-apocalyptic fiction. However exotic some of them may be in the flight of their sci-fi fantasy, they can still be seen cannily or uncannily for science in the sense that the arrival of these works of fiction more than match the recurrence of viral epidemics in our century, beginning with SARS in 2002 to COVID-19 now. The world has seen at least five epidemics and pandemics in the past 20 years, which is quite a rattling average. 
The steady flow of the works of fiction in copying them in their plots as apocalyptic force is quite an indicator of the fact that humans have in some measure started looking back at some very basic issues related to the survival of the human race. The text uh, we take a close look at in our talk is Jack London's The Scarlet Plague, which is a novel running into less than 150 odd pages. First published in uh, 1912, the novel is said to be a prescient work because within six years of its publication, the world saw the deadly pandemic of Spanish flu. Since the novel has been frequently categorized as a post-apocalyptic work, it would be worthwhile to see what constitutes a post-apocalyptic novel. Right at the start of her book on post-apocalyptic novel, Heather J. Hicks mentions some identifying features of the novels in the category. Among others, she lists a desert island, a life of unimaginable solitude, desperate scavenging, despair, hope, and escape as elements that have appeared in some very recent novels by some of uh, the world's most prominent authors. This was a quote. More or less, these elements of the post-apocalypse are obviously available in the Scarlet Plague. But it does not take us to a desert island, literally. You have the geographical locale that is set up right up front in the narrative, is that of a wilderness with the remnants of a civilization in distant past. The embankment of a railroad is there, but the iron of the rails is rusty, and the rotten timber in its bed thirsts itself at curious angles. The outer frame narrative has just four humans in it, three boys and an old man. He's grassner, grandson to the boys. There are a few others mentioned too, but farther away, and only as members of some other tribes. It's not scavenging actually that one comes across in the novel, and it certainly is not desperate, but the sustenance of the people in the novel is entirely dependent on seafood or on what they hunt or on what they would get from the herds they rear. Of course, there's despair in the narrative in all that Grantham recalls and tells about the sudden collapse of a thriving civilization, pushing a handful of survivors into a life of nomadic barbarism, but Toward the end, it also shows hope in Grant's cave of saved books and his, in his theory of cyclical fall and rise of uh, civilization. And following the line of argument in Heather Hicks in her book, we can safely place the Scarlet Plague inside what she identifies as, I quote, the long story of modern post-apocalyptic fiction beginning with the depots, Robinson Crusoe, and a journal of the plague year. One of the qualities of the novel is that it stays faithfully and realistically committed to the basics. There's nothing of the far-fetched exoticness of science in it, and nor a flight of improbable fantasy. The commitment to the basics is there in the frame story located in the year 2073, as well as in the second story, uh, which uh, Granset tells and recollects. Uh, and that is the story of the cataclysmic events during and in the immediate aftermath of the outbreak of uh, Scarlet Plague in 2013. The novel would squarely fall in the category of what Mary Menikian denotes as catastrophic novels, writing about the assertion that speculative fiction is of utility. Menikian mentions the implicit claims that catastrophe novels novelist makes, and I quote, the claim, the events he describes are possible, that they are probable, and are also plausible. The frame story in the novel is minimal, and there's nothing in it that would strain the principles of possibility, probability, and possibility. It opens with a scene that looks like media's race, but is not. The reader gets everything in the right sequence, First comes the landscape described in such a way that it captures the slow dynamism of nature, reclaiming its space earlier, taken over by, by, by what humans call development. And then enter an old man and a boy. The old man has a touch of palsy, making his movements tremulous, 
He wears a mangy garment and a skull cap of goat skin and has a visor made of a large leaf. The boy accompanying him wears a ragged edged piece of bare skin with a hole in the middle through which to thrust his head. He carries a medium sized bow with a quiver full of arrows on his back and a hunting knife in a shield hanging about his neck on a thong. A while later, um, another, after the boy has, uh, a while later, the boy has had a face off with a bear and has killed a rabbit. And after the two have walked some distance, the scene shifts to a stretch of sand dunes bordering the sea, where there are goats browsing among the sandy hillocks, a cooking fire tended by third, uh, a third savage looking boy with several wolfish uh, looking dogs crouching near him. More or less everything in the two contiguous seas, the one along the railroad embankment earlier and the one at the seashore now is typical and symptomatic of a nomadic life that actually existed some millennia ago. Located in the year 2073, the scenes wouldn't mean anything in themselves. They earn their significance through and from the story the old man grandson tells from his memory about the events that took place six years ago, that is in the year 2013 in San Francisco. The maximum action in the novel takes place uh, in the story that Grantzett tells and thus makes the novel worth what it is. And though the story is told in a typical and classic situation with everyone sitting around the cooking fire on the beach and the storyteller waxing reminiscent after having eaten his heart full of crabs, which he calls to some delicacy, it means very little to the boy that is told to, because they have only been born in these nomadic clans and know nothing beyond their herds and hunting, and because they are, as the novel calls them, true savages, and their vocabularies lack and miss the greater portion of the words Granson uses. The actual listeners of Granson's story, uh, which is his memory, are therefore we, the readers, the readers of the novel when it came out, and the readers ever afterwards the readers then and the readers thereafter. Told reflectively by Grandson, remembering the events around the outbreak of the imaginary Scarlet Plague and its immediate aftermath, the story takes up more than three quarters of the novel. It begins logically and plausibly, with Grandson's narration activated and spurred by the memory of the beach alive with men, women, and children on a present Sunday. He is what Gerard Jeanette would identify as the fully homodiegetic narrator in and of the story he tells. And the story he tells is the authenticity of narration and the strength of philosophical convictions. We can count two reasons for these qualities in his tale. One, that he is taught at a university, he taught at a university, which is always a place dealing with the ever happening developments in knowledge. And two, that he had been a professor of literature, Professor James Howard Smith. And as such, had read and spoken about the books other men had written. His extensive reading had given him his ability to see, as Wordsworth puts it, the impassioned expression which is in the countenance of all signs. From the point it begins, around 30 or so pages after the start, depending on the format of the publication, to just around 10 pages before the end of the novel, the story told by Grandsir, written by Professor James Robert Smith, is graphic in the city. <laughs> that it portrays realistic uh, scenes of the quiet, the sudden outbreak of the Scarlet Plague, killing the infected with an hour. No portrays authentic pictures of human nobility on the one hand and of wickedness on the other. The authentic pictures of unbudging sacrifice on the one hand and of cruel robbery, killing and arson on the other. As the tale progresses, then uh, it narrates the slow regression of the few surviving individuals of into a kind of life that nomadic clans lived many thousand years ago. Everything that goes into the pictures is realistic. That is the nobility or the weakness of human nature, the struggle to survive, and the principles of possibility, probability, and possibility. Beyond the content of the story, a very interesting feature of the narrative is the unique rigid connection creates between Grenza as a narrator and the three boys as the listeners. At one level, it's a classic oral situation with an old man telling his grandchildren what can be called a moral tale in many senses. At another level, however, it is intriguing because the kind of gap 
the two worlds in the novel brings in have between them. That is the world of the present in which the frame story takes place and the world of 60 years ago that comes up in the story grants a tent. There are two things that are interesting about the way these two worlds come up. One of which is uh, that the scientifically advanced and developed world is in the past. So this inversion goes very fine with the post-apocalyptic character of the novel. The other interesting thing about the situation is the fact that the listeners in the story, Edwin, Hugo, and Helen, have to imagine of a time many centuries ahead of their own. What in the novel is the past that grants live is also the future of the future generation of the hundreds of years after Edwin, Wuhu, and Helen. So we get three worlds interestingly lined up in the novel. The world that Grants remembers in the story he tells, the world in which he tells the story to the three boys, and then third, the world of the very distant future that the boys can only half visualize, and visualize they must, if they can, because that goes with Gans's philosophizing about the continuous cycle, the rise and fall of human civilization. That is, and this is what he states in his final message, just as the old civilization passed, so will the new. It may take 50,000 years to build, but it will pass. All things pass. Only remain cosmic force and matter, ever in flux, ever acting and reacting and realizing the eternal types, unquote. And it is here, in these paragraphs nearing the end, that introspection quietly turns philosophical. More or less, the element of introspection runs throughout the novel. There's nothing specific that would make the narration appear as such, yet one would notice a current of introspection characterizing the old man's story in particular. It is an introspection that an old man as a survivor is making aloud on behalf of the entire human population, whatever of it is left, which is just as he estimates between 350 and 400. The major points of his introspection in his story concern human behavior, what sustains life and what ensures survival is the former. The nobility that comes manifested in the sacrifice of their own lives a few characters make in order that others can live. Because his creator, Jack London, was a socialist, Grants' introspection is character characterized by a clear secular socialist thought as such. There's a usual, the usual emphasis on science as a savior, not some imagined or supposed extraterrestrial entity, for example. It is a story Grantzer says this about bacteriologists trying to study the bacteria causing the plague, I quote. They were killed in the laboratories, even if they studied the germ of the scarlet death. They were heroes. As fast as they perished, others stepped forth and took their places, unquote. In a way, the story he tells gets a practice in his long explanation of the phenomenon of germs as a cause of disease. And whatever he says about germs is in keeping with the contemporary state of knowledge in bacteriology and virology. Like an academic addressing a set of students, he quotes an imaginary bacteriologist warning. Soldier Wilski, as early as 1929, told the bacteriologists that they had no guarantee against some new disease, a thousand times more deadly than any they knew, arising and killing by hundreds of millions of even billions. In a substantial part of his story, Gansa traces the history of the 60 years from 2013, the year of the collapse of uh, the civilization, to 2073, the time present in the novel. As he does so, he speaks of uh, the scattered survivors uh, of the Scarlet Plague coming together in groups and clans and tribes successively. In all he says, he maintains full compliance with the social sciences of anthropology and history. In the narrative that somewhat philosophically underscores the psychical rise and fall of organizations, stretches of time, measuring thousands of years, the idea of hope may appear misplaced. It may appear more misplaced, considering the old man's maundering in the early pages um, about um, all man's toil upon the planet being just so much form. Yet, in spite of this note of dejection in Grant's tone early, one can be inclined towards civilization. 
and visualizes a new Aryan drift around the world over a hundred generations, unquote. And then he says, after man has uh, repopulated the planet, the power of the wonderful thing called steam and of lightning flash will be saved again. As he musingly visualizes that future, he thinks of man relearning the alphabet and language. And he visualizes his role too in this. And now I conclude, the Scarlet Plague, while it has been credited with the reputation of being a precise novel in view of the Spanish flu of 1918, it has made uh, into several lists of writings that have dealt with the theme of epidemics and pandemics, describing the novel as one of the first examples of post-apocalyptic novel in modern literature. Michel Augusto Riva and Marta Benediti see in it an exploration of what they call the motif of play, the motif of play, as consistent and well spread topos in literature, and therefore denote it as, I quote, a part of a long literary tradition inviting the reader to reflect on the ancestral fear of humans toward infectious diseases. Writing about post apocalyptic writings, Mephias Klassen observes that the fiction in this category, quote, depends on the uniquely human capacity for counterfactual composition and extrapolates much further from empirical reality than, say, social realism. The novel remains faithfully and realistically uh, grounded in the basics of the actually explainable human experience. The Scarlet Plague, though sometimes listed among the famous and forgotten, is a work of fiction that has a special place and post apocalyptic writings. I don't know, Professor Barad, whether I have time or not, but uh, later on I'll share with you the. Uh, uh, so it was wonderful. It was wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Prakash Joshi, sir. Uh, if you'll pass on your notes to us, we will also share with uh, all the participants. Many sure, of sure. them are commenting that they are interested in reading the notes thoroughly because sure. they found it thought provoking, sir. Okay, sir. Thanks a I'll lot, sir. That, sir Thank has you. joined us from Madhya Pradesh, uh, Sagar District, Central University uh, there. So this was the last presentation of our plenary third session, the final one. Uh, uh, many, many participants who were asking for a participation certificate. I would request them to uh, vi uh, visit this page on our website uh, form and you have to submit some of the screenshots uh, and uh, other information. Then you can watch uh, the recorded videos uploaded on YouTube and Facebook. And from that also you can take screenshots for sharing this. But uh, only those, those participants who will share the screenshots and fill the feedback form will get the participation certificate. Uh, all the paper presenters will get the certificate for the certificate of paper presentation, you need not submit screenshots uh, of any of the sessions uh, uh, there. Uh, in this case, if there is any further doubt, you can write it to me and I will explain further if it, there is a need for that. Uh, 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 again, I thank all the plenary speakers uh, here. Uh, Ompi Juneja, sir. Madhvi, Nikam, Madam, Kalyani, Vallath, Madam, T.S. Chandra Molly, sir, and Prakash Joshi, sir, for being Thank you, sir. a part Thank of you. this uh, uh, webinar. And because of Thank your you. endeavor, because of your hard work, your scholarly uh, papers, that this uh, the quality of this webinar has really improved uh, in its essence. Thank you, all of you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, uh, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah. For the participation, we are meeting after 15 minutes for our paper presentation session. After 15 minutes, you have to log in again. We are logging off right now. Thank you, all of you.